Okay, so today we have a uh, very special speaker um, who is a native of Connecticut, uh, but today she's here in Brooklyn. She's a transplant from Connecticut over to Brooklyn, uh, who I recently met, but I found her to have one of the most interesting business ideas that I have ever heard. So I asked her to come be the guest speaker today uh, uh, at the class. So let's give it up for our guest speaker, Sarah Nadell. So, just take a minute. How many of you guys work also with this kind of How many of you guys work in jobs that are not related to the major? Um, so I worked at Starbucks off the college, and I don't have the numbers for Starbucks, but I do. But take a minute and think about how much money is spent every single day hiring and training new employees at Burger King in America. Every single day. Think about if you guys ever worked in the food service industry, you might know what that looks like. Anybody want to throw out a number? For like uh, five days of training? Whatever their training process is. So yeah, it costs about like $9 per hour, 40 hours. Then 360 for training a guy. Over the course of the week? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's a great, what's your name? Shimon. Shimon. Yeah. That's a great start. So that's part of the cost. There's also the cost of interviewing, publicizing, um, the food that the new employee ruined in their process, um, and then onboarding them into the system, there's some tax costs and stuff like that. So every single day, Burger King, Burger King has about 365,000 crew members. Not, not just the company, because they're a franchisee. There are about 365,000 people who work at Burger King. And most of them leave once a year which means that there are about a thousand people leaving every single day. Wow. Now Burger King's internal estimates are that it costs them $5,000 every time they have to hire and train somebody new. Which means every single day there's $5 million being spent hiring and training employees at Burger King. So that's a lot of money. And so my company, Seller Employee, seeks to lower turnover in these types of jobs by matching job applicants to jobs where they're most likely to succeed and do well and stay for a period of time. And the way we envision this is a job search 2.0. So um, how did you guys get your jobs? Did you walk around? Anyone walk around and apply to jobs? Craigslist? Anyone do Craigslist? Indeed? Monster.com? You don't want looking for a job around here. <laughs> so so um, we envision a world where instead of logging on and doing a keyword search, you know, I'm looking for a job, uh, I'm a business student, I'm looking for an internship, whatever, you log on and you fill out a 15 to 25 minute evaluation where you tell us a little bit about yourself. You tell us about your preferences. You tell us what motivates you to do well at work. You tell us when you can work, when you we learn a little bit about your skill set, so it's a little bit of skill set evaluation. And then based on that outcome, we give you a list of jobs where we would love to recommend you. So if you're looking for that first job, in my case Starbucks, I wouldn't have to go around to every restaurant in um, Mount Palo Alto, which is where I went to college. I could just, and submit a different application, I could just say who I was and they would say, listen, you're a good fit for Starbucks, you're really not a good fit for Bukiti Bebos. So you don't want to work in such a fast-paced environment or something like that. And meanwhile, employers can log on. They can say, you know, I need um, three more people for the Starbucks on Hillel, and we'll give them a list of people who we think who are looking for a job who we think are going to do great. So we envision a job match where we're, we're looking at people's underlying personalities and where they're likely to do well. So that's what the company does now. Um, we're called Stellar Employee. But I want to tell you guys a little bit about how I got there. And I want to tell you a little bit about how I got there 
um, in the context of a very particular thing that I, I personally work to learn um, and improve on. And the timing, we couldn't have timed this better because this class opened with Professor Leibowitz encouraging you guys to get in touch with him and ask him questions. And shortly around the time I was thinking about launching this company, I had the opportunity to hear Reed Hoffman give a speech. Do you guys know who Reed Hoffman is? You guys, anybody on LinkedIn? Reed Hoffman is the founder of LinkedIn. You should be. <laughs> you should all be on LinkedIn. Reed Hoffman is the founder of LinkedIn. And before that, he was the founder of PayPal. Anybody use PayPal when you buy stuff online? And uh, someone asked him what he found to be really useful. And he said that when he was an undergrad, he was at Oxford University. And he had a professor. He said, this guy was the smartest guy I ever met. And he used to just walk around with a list of things he wanted to learn more about in the back of his head. He always had a couple things he was thinking about. And when he met someone who he thought could help him think through that process, he could ask them, oh, you know, what do you, what do you think, I was thinking about this today on the subway, what's the biggest, what's the biggest cause of delays on the subway for the afternoon? Um, or what's, what are they advertising most on TV? What's the overhead on, uh, what was that company? Trivago. Trivago, I wrote it down. Um, and that, and so, and I actually think that that's a great way to move in the world, particularly when you're an entrepreneur, because we as entrepreneurs feel so much pressure and so much expectation to know everything, not only about our business, but about how to launch our business. And I have a lot of education. You guys are going to hear about it in a minute. But I am not, I don't know everything about accounting and legal. I don't know everything about managing people. I don't know how to do marketing. I don't know how to do PR. I can't do all of that and be the master of database hiring. And so I just, so if we can all as entrepreneurs become comfortable with the fact that we don't know everything, but we're surrounded by a world of people who do and who can help us, um, it's, a, it's a much more comfortable way to walk in the world. And it's a much, it gives you a great opportunity to improve on your concept as well as to really these entrepreneurs. So I'm gonna tell you my backstory, and these are the key players. I can't even remember this guy's last name and he was a key player in my life. These are the key players in my story. Uh, so when I was your age, I was studying international relations. I thought I wanted to work in America. That was my goal. I want to work abroad. I want to um, participate in economic development programs. And I always thought I would work at the World Bank. So I finished undergrad. I was very lucky. I got a job working for a company called Innovations for Poverty Action. And they do research abroad. They sent me to Peru. Um, I had studied Spanish in college. I was not a native Spanish speaker. I studied for Spanish in college. I studied in Peru to do research. And I spent two years in Peru traveling around the country doing implementing development programs. So I was hiring surveyors. I was working on anybody heard of microfinance? I was working on microfinance programs. And, um, and then I, uh, Peru, was, Peru was a really interesting experience for a lot of reasons. Um, but I realized I needed to learn more to get, you know, my ultimate, my ultimate goal is World Bank. Um, so I decided to go to grad school. I got very lucky. I got a full scholarship to the Harvard Kennedy School, which is a public school administration. And I got to, I got to go to Harvard. And because of that name, I got my internship, my dream internship with the World Bank that summer. So I go down to DC, I'm working at the World Bank, I'm working at a part of the World Bank called the International Finance Corporation. And they've hired me to, um, to participate in some research about microfinance, which I knew something about. So I get down there, brutal, just brutal. It was so slow, so bureaucratic, I couldn't get anything done. Uh, people meandered in at 9.30 in the morning with their, they spent all day having networking coffees. They started powering down their five-year-old computers at 4.30 so that they could leave at five. I felt like these people aren't getting anything done. They haven't had the experiences I've had living and working in Peru. And they, they actually don't know. I want to move in a fast-paced environment. I like to move quickly. And this is not a good fit for me. So I go back to Harvard and I'm like, oh my god. And this is the fall of 2008. The economy is crashing all around me. And I'm like, what? I don't, I don't want to, I, I just spent the last summer investing in a job I really don't want. And now there's literally no jobs. Everyone I know is just found a job. So what am I going to do? Um, now, something interesting had happened when I was preparing to go to the World Bank. 
Uh, I went to my brother's sporting event. My brother had some type of game. He was a type in high school at the time. And I went to cheer him on, and I was talking to my parents about my summer internship. And this man named Thomas Berry says to me, you're going to work at the World Bank this summer? He says, I sometimes do business with the World Bank. So he said, oh, give, me your, give me your phone number. I'll give you a call when I'm down in D.C. I'd love to hear about your experiences with the World Bank. So Thomas Berry, I don't know anything about him. Thomas Berry comes down to D.C. and we, we catch up. And it turns out that he has a company that does investing, co-investing with the World Bank. And he runs a couple of businesses in Latin America. At the time, we don't have a whole lot to say to each other because I still don't think I want to be a business person. I'm like, yeah, I want to live in Latin America and run social programs. But I thought, well, this guy clearly is good at something. He's really smart. So I'll keep in touch with him. So I've made my, so the World Bank, I've made my connection with Tom Berry. And I go back. I don't know what I'm going to do. The economy's crashing. Um, and I got very lucky again. My advisor said, well, why don't you stay and do a PhD? You're not going to get a job anyway. Why don't you just stick around for a while? So I said, sure. I really like, I know I like data. I've been doing research for the past four years. Why don't I just do a little bit more research? So I stuck around. Now, so I do my PhD, and it comes time for me to choose a dissertation. Do you guys have um, final papers for your program at all? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> For this class, or for this, yes. okay. For this class. So, so I thought, you know, well, what am I curious about? I'm going to spend the next, on average, it takes someone three years to write a dissertation. I'm going to spend the next three years thinking about this. I've never done anything for three years. What do I want to think about? And I thought back to my experience in Peru. And one of the things that had really struck me about Peru is that um, Peru is a country that is growing really, really quickly. And most of the people who were maybe 10 years older than me when I was living in Peru, hadn't really had jobs, formal jobs, most of their lives. They maybe worked in their parents' bodega, maybe driven a taxi. But suddenly, the economy is growing quickly, and there are a lot of companies that are hiring, and they need to hire people who don't have any work experience. And people who are great employees but don't have any work experience are having troubles showing that they can do the job. So employers are saying, no thanks, we want someone with work experience. And these people are saying, are you kidding? All I want to do, I'm such a great employee. All I want to do is work. I'm so smart. And they can't get the job. And that's hard for both because companies can't hire the people that they want to hire. So I started thinking, well, so from an economic, you know, from a really academic standpoint, this, this question is called the skill set signaling problem. So I'm thinking, OK, so I will, I'd like to research skill set signaling. What happens if I can come up with a way to show that these people are really good employees? Any of you guys ever get you're not experienced enough, like looking for summer jobs? So these people are really hard workers, and they've done, and they know what they need to know for this job. Um, so I started looking at um, the idea of implementing a program. We do evaluations, and then we say to employers, "Trust me, this guy's really good. This guy's really good." Uh, and I realized I had written a business plan. Had I written a dissertation, I'd written a business plan. And remember, I was bored in international development. And I was thinking that if everything was moving too slowly, I'd now spent four years at Harvard, I hadn't been abroad, and I was like ready to pick it up. And so I go back to Tom Berry, and I say, listen, I wrote this business plan to do evaluation of employees for jobs in emerging markets, what do you think? And he said, he said, you know what, I have businesses in India and I have businesses in Kenya that could really use that. I think this is a great idea. I think you should go back to Peru and spend this time launching this company and see what happens. And I'd like to invest in your company. Can you tell us when was that? When was it? It was May of 2012. May of 2012. Now this is based on the fact that I had coffee with Tom Berry maybe every six months for two years. And every time I'd say, this is what I'm learning, this is what I don't know. What are you doing? What do you think is interesting to you right now? Where's your attention going? And he knew me after two years. And he said, I, he said you're, you're an interesting thinker. I think this is an interesting idea. So you should go. So suddenly, I have my first investor. Now, 
I made a mistake. People look at how much money that he has, how what a percentage of the company he has, and they're like, you gave him way too much of your company. And I'm like, are you kidding? I didn't know what I was doing. I wouldn't have launched this company if it wasn't for him. He can have a, he can have a whole company in front of him. So anyway, I have him. So now I have four months. I'm still living in Boston. I'm getting ready to go down to Peru. And I'm just, and so I have questions. I'm thinking of questions. What are the things that I would like to know more about? And I start thinking about, okay, well, what do employers, how does evaluation typically work right now when you're hiring people? What do employers do when they're trying to hire people? Do they care? And another thing, and this is, a, this is something that is not part of my business anymore, do they care about validating people's back work experience? Do they care about making sure that someone's CV is correct? Do they care about where they go to school? So around this time, I meet Becca Gallenberg. Becca Gallenberg is the maid of honor at my friend's wedding. I've never met her before. We're standing around in the, during the cocktail hour after the wedding, and I start talking to her. I quickly realize, all right, she's really something that I don't, somebody I don't think I have a whole lot in common. She's lived, she lives in Arizona, I never lived in Arizona. She's kind of quiet, we're kind of not clicking, and then she says, oh, I work in HR at uh, General Electric. At the time it was General Electric. And I said, oh, click. What do you guys do when you're evaluating? What do you guys, what do you, how do you guys hire people? What do you guys do when you're looking at people's backgrounds? And she said, oh, uh, well we have this system and we have this system and she tells me a bunch of stuff and I said, wow, that's really interesting. And suddenly she perks up because this she, she's interested in this too, right? And I said, yeah, you know, I'm thinking about launching this company. I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I have this idea. I'm kind of batting it around. What do you think? And she said, you know, I don't really know about this. She said, why don't we keep in touch? So now I have Becca Gallenberg reading for me as well. I go down to Peru. So I arrive in Peru. Of like first day in Peru, first day round two in Peru. Um, I don't have, I don't know, I don't have anything. I don't have a plan at all. I'm like wake up and I'm like I'm just gonna go talk to people. So I don't know. So you know, I mean, I have done. I'm maybe playing down my preparation a little bit, but I really didn't know what I was doing. So I go to my old employer. <laughs> I kind of knock on their door and I was like, hey, I'm back. Um, can I kick around here for a while? And, take advantage of your internet. And they were like, sure, you know, here's a desk, do whatever you want to do. And I just start calling all the people that I used to know when I lived in Peru. What are you guys doing? Can I buy you a coffee? Um, so during this time, there's this guy, Mike, whose name I still don't even remember. Um, Mike works at this, at IPA now. He's American. I never worked with him before. And he would, he would like to apply to grad school at Harvard. So he says to me, Sarah, I'm really interested in your experiences applying to grad school. Can I buy you a coffee? I said, sure. So I'm going into this copy thinking it's going to be about him. But, and slowly I realize he knows a lot about data analysis. So then we kind of start talking about data analysis and we develop this connection. Um, so I'm going to jump, now I'm like into day two of my company and I'm probably 18 minutes into my presentation. So I'm going to jump ahead for a while. So, uh, so I end up starting to talk to a lot of employers. I'm doing these evaluations. I'm evaluating college kids just to make sure that we have an evaluation that works. I offered some free evaluations to a local college. Um, and pretty soon I could say, okay, I've evaluated 300 people. And this is what we've learned. Um, they're all kids like you, that, you guys are kids. They're all two young adults like you. They're all looking for jobs. And they, they, they want to know their own abilities. But then I start taking it to employers. And it turns out employers are like, well, you know, they pick, they're like, who, is, who are you guys? We had launched our company. Our company was called Fair Alito Federalito. Little, what is it? What did you say? Federalito. What? Federalito. Little Lighthouse. Federalito. Yeah. <laughs> Peruvian Spanish, my uh, 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 my, uh Little Lighthouse. Um, with, cause, so we're identifying, we're laying up information. We're identifying information on people. So they're going, who the, who the heck is Fair Alito? That's so weird. Um, and well, I don't know what this test is. What are you guys talking about? So we're like, man, that was a mistake. So then we started trying to sell to employers. So uh, I had, I, over the next year and a half, we changed our company 15 times. And I actually ended up writing my dissertation about how much I changed my company. Um, and, but we're constantly learning. We're constantly getting feedback. I'm about a year and a half in, and I, 
call and I send an email on way to Becca Gallenberg and I said, hey Becca, I just want you to know these are the things that I've been up to. This, you know, this is what we're doing. We've at this point evaluated 1,500 people. We're still kind of trying to figure out sales. And one of the things that I'm having trouble with is figuring out, I'm selling to heads of HR and their incentives are to look really good to the COO. And I can't figure out how to make, how to solve their problem. So I'm selling them good evaluation and lower turnover, but what's the number they need to show to the COO? And what are the graphs that they want for their monthly reports? And, I, uh, and so I said, can we talk? Can you give me some advice about this? So we get on the phone, and at the end of the call, she says, she's moved, she now works at Google. She's the head of talent analytics at Google. And she says, you know what? She said, I'd like to invest in your company. I think you're going to be really interesting. Girl sitting at a bar at a wedding, now I have investor number two. And she's supporting us, and she's really interested in talent analytics. Now around, around that time, I'm back in the US, and I give Mike a call. Mike is now working for a group in the US that supports entrepreneurs abroad. And he's still working on, he's gonna, he's decided to postpone applications for two years. So I call him, I say, how are your applications going? We get coffee, we get coffee. And, um, and suddenly I realized that in his, in his US incarnation, he's been working with a lot of international companies that are having a lot of the problems I'm having, dealing with the most boring stuff in the world. Registering, it took me nine months to register my company in Peru. Getting uh, permission to work abroad, dealing with international taxes, getting a lawyer, all this stuff. And, I, and suddenly, and I'm like, man, you know so much about this. Can, who can you, do you have any ideas? Do you have any people you can connect me to? And he said, well, you know what, I, knew, I know this guy, Andre. I know this guy, Andre Barreto, who you should talk to. Andre Barreto. You guys are, did I, has anyone ever heard of Groove Shark? Yeah, you guys were like in fifth grade when Groove Shark came out. So Groove Shark was a precursor to Spotify. It was this website that you could go online and you could go to Groove Shark and you could say what you wanted to listen to and it would scrape, like Professor Lewis was talking about, it would scrape every YouTube, everything online and pull it all together and you could listen to it. Um, it was totally illegal. So Andres doesn't like it when I call him the founder of Groove Shark, but that's what he is. He's the founder of Groove Shark. He's Colombian American. He really likes supporting companies. He sold Group Shark to start another company, he made a lot of money. He really likes supporting companies that hire people in Latin America. And Mike said, oh, you should talk to Andres because he's gonna know a lot more about this. So then I talked to Andres. And I say, Andres, I'm having a lot of trouble with you know, my lawyer stuff, I, I can't figure this stuff out. He gives me some advice. Then he says to me, what is the one metric that you're improving every single week? And I, I kind of was like, I don't know. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to make money every single week. And he said, no, 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 no. You need a focus. What is the one metric that you are working on every single week? And again, I said, well, I don't know. It, you know, it could be number of clients. It could be income, revenues. Um, it could be like number of tests because we do price differently for different clients. And he was like, Sarah, you are talking like a PhD, and you are not talking like an entrepreneur. You need to figure out what is the one thing you are going to focus on and you need to learn how to focus. And that, and it was really embarrassing for one thing to have that conversation. Um, and that's another thing you have to get used to and I had to get used to as an entrepreneur. And Andres became a an mentor and also an investor. And I had another phone call with Andres last week and you know what? He said basically the same thing. He was like, what is the one thing you are trying to do? <laughs> I said, I don't know, I need your help. That's why I'm talking to you right now. Um, so suddenly Mike has given me, this guy who bought me coffee and asked me if I ever heard is giving me another person. How much time do I have? Uh, probably about five minutes. Okay, great. So this, so, so this, so finally, so this is how I built up my coterie of people. We have a client base in Peru, we're doing evaluations for companies, we're lowering turnover, we have demonstrated lower turnover, and we found something really cool which is that it's not just the skill set. It's not just skills that make someone a good worker. It's what their preferences are. It's what they like. And you could be a good worker at, um, we actually worked with two companies that were competing to be the Home Depot of Peru. 
So they looked almost exactly the same. They sold exactly the same stuff. They were priced exactly the same. They had, they almost had stores right across the street from each other. Turns out the types of people who did well in each of those stores were really different. And that had to do with the incentive structures of those stores, with the way they paid people. And so then we realized something really cool. It wasn't just evaluating for companies. This is where we could do this mix and match. And this is where we could generate efficiencies by building up a bunch of applicants who are just looking for a job and a bunch of employees who are looking to hire. So this is suddenly we've hit on our models. We, we have our investors and advisors. And we decide to expand because Peru is not a big market. There's only about 12 million people who work in Peru. Um, and so Andres actually convinces me to go back to the US. He says, it's very difficult to make sales in Latin America. It's a totally different beast. Um, go, just give the, get, he said, what are you maximizing? And I said, number of paid evaluations per week. And he said, good. Are you going to get more in Peru or in the US? And I said, the US. And he said, go home. <laughs> so I decided to go home, and um, but there was something that really bugged me, which is that I had a team in Peru. I had three employees. I loved my employees, and I wanted. I didn't. I want. They loved our company. They loved Fairly Do, and I. I. I stayed up nights thinking about what was going to happen to them, and I feeling like a failure. Um, but I had met this guy Guillermo de Blanco. Peruvian, who was launching an angel investor network in Peru. And he had said to me a long time ago, he had said, you should come and pitch to the network. And I, you know, and I'm thinking this day is coming up and I'm like, why am I going to pitch to the Peruvian investor network? I just decided to move back to the US. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to tell them I'm moving back to the US. I'm gonna, my story is a failure story. It's not a success story. But I thought, I'll just see. You never know who's going to be at these things. There's going to be, they told me there's going to be 50 people. You just never know. So I prepared a great pitch, um, went down there, pitched, and got no investors, no investor meetings, in fact. But I did get this one guy, Alvaro Coyas, came up to me and he said, I'm a partner of the big headhunting firm in Peru. Uh, I want you to meet my friend. Carlos, who's an entrepreneur. And nine months after that first meeting, on February 29th, Monday, February 29th of this year, Alvaro and Carlos signed a licensing agreement with me to take over for the operation. And they are going, they are giving my staff jobs, and they are going to pay me here. They are a US company for use of our, of our licensing, for use of our technology, for use of our tests in our algorithm. So you really just never know what's going to happen. Um, and so now I'm launching in the US. I'm launching Stellar Employee, we're called Stellar Employee. And I just wanted to give you one final example. I had a phone call last week with this guy named Don Fox. You guys ever eaten at Firehouse Subs? I don't even know if it's around here. I've never eaten at Firehouse Subs. Firehouse Subs is one of the fastest growing, most respected um, fast food places, industries, companies in the US. They are doubling in size over the next three years. Don Fox has won a lot of awards. He's the CEO. He's won a lot of awards for management. And someone got me on the phone with him to see if he would like to buy our product. And I get on the phone with him and I tell him about what we do. And he says to me, you know what, Sarah, our turnover is less than half industry. This doesn't make sense for us. And I'm like, hmm. I'm like, I really need this sale. And then I realized, oh, well, I have a lot of questions in the back of my head about how to lower turnover and what are the, what are the best practices. And so I picked myself up and I said, OK, Doc, how do, why do you think your turnover is so low? And he said, I think it's because we're, re we're really clean. We have a really clean operation. He said, I think it's because we're really careful about where we put our stores. And he told me a lot of things that I thought were really interesting that then I took and, mentioned, and said, I can say to someone else, well, industry, you know, industry experts say that the reasons, another reason to lower turnover is to think very carefully about who, what your hiring pool is and to make sure that the job looks attractive. And then at the end of the call, I said, Don, this was great. Is there someone else I can talk to? And he said, oh, yeah, I have a buddy who's launching a QSR in Arizona. I can talk to him. But I couldn't have done that if I, did, if I felt horrible about the fact that I couldn't have sold to him. 
And I think that um, if you can, I, basically for me, the hardest thing I've had to learn is how to not be embarrassed about being wrong all the time and how to not think about um, everyone expecting me to be right and everyone I can learn from. And take advantage of people like your professor who are saying, you know, you have a question. And that's I it. have the first question. Quick okay. Let's hear it for Sarah. Sarah's very, very humble. She not only went to Harvard, but she went to Stanford undergrad. So she's really a, a, a stellar a, a employee, as we know. Could you just tell what the business model is to the class? How you make money? Oh, yeah, very sure. simply, Sorry. what's the revenue? I what's your expense? Right over that. Just very simply. Yeah, so we charge uh, location stores $50 a month. So it's different between the U.S. and Peru, and that's one of the reasons we have like security. In the U.S., we charge uh, stores $50 a month to have access to our applicant pool. And we will publicize the job for them. We'll do two things. We'll publicize the job for them, and we'll create, we'll give them a sign they can put in the video that says, you know, if you want to work here, go to this website. And when the man and the managers will tell us, listen, I'd like to do all of my interviews between 1 and 2 p.m. on Thursdays. And we'll do the preliminary filter, and then we'll say to the applicants, listen, we think you're going to be a great fit for job X. Why don't you call the manager at this number at 1 p.m. on Thursday? And so the applicants have gotten uh, access to an interview really quickly, not the sort of back and forth that you typically see. They know, okay, Thursday I'm going to make this phone call. I know I'm going to like this job because they explain to me why. And the uh, interviewer can just set aside one hour a week to do their hiring. Um, and so the other month, and we, so it's a SaaS model. You guys familiar with that concept? The software as a service is when you pay a regular fee for access to a website. It's a SaaS model and it's competitive with things like Craigslist or Snagger Job or any of the other companies that you might see out there. Okay, and it's just not a, a per employee, just a flat fee. So for a McDonald's yeah. or a Burger King or Dunkin' Donuts, each store would pay a, a fee or would it be a franchise yeah, fee? Yeah, so it's for each location, but we typically work with franchisors who have a lot of locations. I see. So if they have 20 locations, it would be 20 times 50. Right, which is much cheaper than the normal employment agency model totally. that gets a percentage of the salary or something. Totally, and like, in fact, we're doing less. So, what you know, we're typically these companies are doing kind of on their own, and they're just um, accepting employees, or they're just basically accepting applicants. They typically hire. I got my job at Starbucks because I walked in when the manager was there, and I was like, "Are you guys hiring?" The manager was like, "Yes." <laughs> uh, but if the manager wasn't there, I wouldn't have gotten that job. So there's a lot of hiring that happens in an ad hoc way at this level, and so we help them streamline, and they don't lose applicants because they don't happen to be there. Um, but they're not really comparing us to like a manpower or anything like that that does full staffing. They're typically comparing us to online announcement services. Sure. How many of you like this idea or like to invest in our company? Okay, we have wow. great validation over here. Now we have to we have room for another question or two. Okay? Yeah. Is there a fee if we would want to register with you guys? Uh, no, there is no fee. It's, it's free for applicants. Yeah. So right now, and this is this is a, a little bit connected to rolling out very carefully. Right now, we're only, the way you get into our system is if you apply for a job with one of the companies that's using us. So it's not open, and that's really to save you time. Because what, you know, we got, like if you, I don't think actually that we have any jobs in this area, so if you were to log it, like do the whole thing, it'd be, it wouldn't be that helpful, but but ultimately it will always be free for applicants. There's back and forth, yeah. Uh, there are many companies that do the same thing, right? There are many companies that are online job boards, and there are many companies that do evaluation. To my knowledge, there are not a lot of companies in the hourly job space, which is what we do. So we work with companies that are hiring a lot of people at once that are using one evaluation as a mix and match service. Oh, so you're focusing on a certain sector? We're is... focusing on a certain sector because we're really big data analytics. So, oh, so that's how you appreciate yourself from Yeah, you know, you have to start small as well, and so we've decided to be very focused on where we start. Well, I think they're thinking about operating in another country. Um, I think that, you know, I know it's not, 
as an entrepreneur, it's not great to have your attention split. Um, and the brew operation, so the company that's running the brew operations has a license over all of Latin America. And they actually have a license their contract that if they don't get to Colombia within three years, we can take back that license. Um, but uh, I did, someone just approached me last week about India. And I was, but I'm, but but I need to I need to attend to you know I need to be careful about how I allocate my time. Yeah. Okay, let's hear it for Sarah.